Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Antoine Half. I'm uh, the head of the oil uh, program at the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia University. And tonight, we're delighted to uh, host Eric Werner's chief economist of Statoil, who's going to uh, talk about uh, major work that he's led at uh, Statoil for the last uh, couple of years, the, uh, en the energy perspectives, uh, an outlook, a scenario planning exercise, uh, which really contributes in a very uh, meaningful way to the policy debate and the market debate around the energy space uh, globally, not just for Statoil, but for the energy community as a whole. So, um, Eric will uh, speak for a few minutes. Uh, in case you uh, are not, uh, don't fully remember his bio, uh, he has uh, a wealth of experience, uh, not only in, uh, in industry at Statoil, uh, also at uh, Total, at the Norwegian ENP arm of Total, but also in government, uh, at the central bank, uh, in academ academia, uh, and he has a very broad range of, of expertise, uh, energy economics, macroeconomics, uh, policy, the energy space, uh, financial issues, taxation is one of his uh, strong uh, areas of uh, expertise and, and concentration. So lots to talk about. Uh, I let him present uh, the major findings, the major uh, messages from the perspectives. The book came out a few, a few months ago. Uh, and I guess a few things have changed since then. Um, and we might talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers. And uh, it's not just us in the room, but we're also uh, streaming this live uh, on the internet. And people uh, listening to us online have an opportunity to ask questions as well by uh, tweeting their, que their, their questions and our uh, handle is, um, is uh, of course, uh, at uh, Columbia U Energy, uh, and the hashtag is uh, CGEP events. So with that, um, let me just turn it over to Eric. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, it's nice to be in uh, the Pulitzer World Room. Gives, uh, gives a humble Norwegian uh, a bit of the shakes when you do the types of presentation that this is in this type of room but, and, and this is setting. It's a fantastic university to be strolling across and uh, you're lucky that uh, those of you that work here are, are, in a, are lucky to be here. Um, it's an interesting day. I'm going to present our energy perspectives which look at the global energy markets to 2040. It's the fifth year, sixth year we do this uh, publicly. Um, over the last couple of years we've been uh, running this with scenarios, uh, realizing that the uncertainty in the global energy future is huge. Uh, so, so I'll present not one forecast for you, but I'll, I'll present three different uh, outcomes of histories of the future, if you like, or scenarios. Uh, doing it today when we just had the, the World Energy Outlook 2016 being launched in, in Paris and, or in London, but out of Paris this morning, um, makes it also special. We note that the, for the second year in a row, IEA comes a bit closer to our scenarios, in their scenarios. Uh, last year it was the fact that they moved their time horizon from 2035 to 2040. Uh, which we had already done several years ago, and uh, this year, the the changes to the to both the the new policies and uh, and uh, 450 ppm scenarios that IEA uh, now have used over over several years, so the changes that they've made make those scenarios slightly greener than the previous versions of the scenarios, and they come closer to our parallel scenarios, and uh, and uh, that's an interesting. Uh, development, we think, and, and it's not because we are right, but it's because that we, we, what we see is that the, some of the development trends that we, that we see, we see together, and, we, and we, we end up with the same conclusions. I'll try to, to, to do this in 
45 minutes maybe, and then we have, should have ample time for, for Q&A and, and for questions. And if there are things that you need to clarify that you don't understand, please ask, but otherwise we'll leave the debate for, for later, otherwise I won't get through the slides. This year's Energy Perspectives publication, on the front page uh, we put a lot of pictures, uh, trying to illustrate the fact that energy is a very wide topic, both in terms of where the energy is coming from, uh, what it's being used for, and also that the development level in, in different parts of the world where energy is being used, and in particular where energy demand is growing, is significantly different and varying. There are two pictures on the front page of the report and also on these slide pages that could have been from the same emerging economy. It's not, it's from two different countries, but it could have been from the same emerging economy. But, uh, and also illustrates that in parts of the world where the energy demand is growing, the level of development is fantastically different and varying. And that puts a frame, set of framework conditions on the possibility to rapidly change uh, the future of energy. And, and it's, a, it's an important perspective to, 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 to have that in mind, that, that the energy system globally is huge. Uh, we can, be, being based in, in, uh, in the western part of Norway or in California, in Silicon Valley, or even here, you can become very optimistic about the, the ability of the world to rapidly change out of fossil fuels and into something else. But if you travel around or you just move a little bit out of that area, you, can, you see that, uh, that the, the challenges, the, 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 the possibilities of change are very, very different. And the focus is very different. Uh, I was at the Economists Energy Summit in London last week, uh, and I asked uh, the other people in the panel the question, uh, what would we have been talking about if this conference took place in New Delhi? Last week, New Delhi was basically shut down because of local pollution. That affects the way you talk about and think about energy compared to the type of first world issues that we sometimes deal with in, in London or Stavanger or New York. And, and it, it's, an, it's an important perspective, we think, when you think about long-term energy. So this report is our attempt at competing with the likes of the World Energy Outlook of IEA, uh, the Shell scenarios, the BP and Exxon Mobil's energy outlooks. Uh, you can find it, it's available for everybody in PDF version on, at our website, the address is there. Uh, compared to some of the other publications, and in particular the World Energy Outlook, it's fantastically short. It's only a 60-page publication, so it's much easier to read than the 800-page IEA World Energy Outlook. And if you're really busy, you read the chart to the right there, the word cloud, and the, the words there are roughly proportional to the number of times it's been mentioned in the report, and you get an idea of what it's about. It's about energy, it's about economic growth, and the link between economic growth and energy demand. It's more about demand than supply. Ten years back, if we wrote this report, we would probably be more in a peak oil supply, peak energy supply uh, sentiment than we are now. Now we think that, that the, the future level of energy use and the future mix will more be determined by the drivers that drive energy demand than, than the drivers that drive energy supply. So that's what it's about. It's about scenarios, and I'll come back to that. A lot of scenarios, three. Uh, Looking towards the medium term and the long term energy future, it's important to realize that those of us that produce or deliver energy are at the moment in what is at least a triple challenge. Not necessarily a dilemma, but it's a triple challenge. Uh, and that will affect the way we are able to respond to different types of challenges going forward. The first challenge that we have is that we need to satisfy demand. Underlying growth in energy demand is strong in many parts of the world. And when you combine that with the fact that every time we take a, a oil and gas molecule out of the reservoir, the reservoir becomes less willing to give away the next one because the pressure falls, so that the, the supply automatically falls. So we have, a low, we have to invest to keep supply constant, and then satisfying demand, we need to invest even more. So there's a growing gap between energy demand and, and the potential energy supply from existing resources, that is something that we have to uh, adapt to and try to close. So fighting decline from existing fields and satisfying demand is a big challenge for us. Then, of course, the sustainability challenge, which is at least a double challenge. The first one, which is especially in Norway, but I think maybe here parts of, parts of New York as well, the first one is undercommunicated. And that's the fact that the UN last September, September of last year, uh, put clean, affordable, available, reliable energy for all by 2030 into the Sustainable Development Goals 
the list of sustainable development goals. Delivering that is a fantastic challenge. 2.4 billion people do not have access to clean heating and cooking facilities. One of the main reasons why the pollution was so bad in New, Je New Delhi yes, last week is in a CO2 sense, sustainable biomass. But in any other dimension, unsustainable use of biomass that you burn within your homes or outside to keep warm or to cook your food. It's a fantastic challenge to be able to solve that sustainable problem, sustainability problem. And then in addition, of course, we have the need to reduce global CO2 emissions, to get the CO2 emissions from the energy sector down to sustainable levels in terms of global warming. It's a challenge for all of us. And there's, uh, that challenge is not made easy to solve uh, since there's a fantastic lar fantastically large policy gap, if you like, between our targets, as communicated by the Paris Agreement, and the measures that are in place to actually move us towards those targets. There's a big gap there. And it hasn't necessarily become much more narrow over the last year since the, the Paris agree Agreement were, were, were signed. And then at the moment, we also have uh, the third challenge, which is the risk-reward balance is off balance. The, the, the costs are too high, the prices are too low, our ability to invest as energy companies is not there. And we, got, we have to get that right. We have to get costs down and a more sustainable relationship between risk and reward to be able to invest the necessary amounts of money to, su to, to, to su supply the necessary amounts of energy. So that's the triple challenge that we're in. And then when we look forward, the one thing that we're absolutely certain about is that we will be wrong in our forecasts. We will continue to be surprised by events development trends, technology breakthroughs that will give inspiration to, to future front pages of The Economist or other magazines, we will be surprised. Significant uncertainty. And then another uncertain issue that we have to handle is how some of the recent changes that we've seen in the global energy landscape, if you like, how will they develop going forward? And in particular, how will the, some of the large changes that we've seen on the supply and demand side how will they develop? These things that usually look for a while look like exponential growth curves, whether you were talking about supply or demand, but that have a tendency of always becoming an S-curve. At some point, so things that grow very fast for very long do not grow forever. Number of cell phones in the world grew fantastically for many years. Doesn't grow that much anymore because now we basically just replace the old phones with a new one and everybody has more than one on average. Some examples. If you can see that, the purple line going straight up and which is measured on the right side here is the fantastic growth that we've seen in solar capacity over the last 15 years. It's more than 100 doubled, the capacity to produce solar electricity. It's grown from virtually zero to something that is still very small, but grows very fast. Something that is virtually zero and you multiply it by 100 is still almost zero. But it grows fast and the question is how, for how long will it grow at these rates? and then translate in, in from capacity to electricity generation. One of the key challenges that we have when we do these forecasts or scenarios. The other one on the supply side of what we have in here, US shale oil production, 13, 14 doubled over the last 15 years. We're pretty sure that that won't 14, 15 double again over the next 15 years because that would mean that US shale oil production would be half of global oil production. That's not gonna happen. And we saw that in 2015, it already is became flatter. This year it's going to be lower than it was last year, and it's not going to grow by 15 times again. But it, it, it will probably grow, but we don't know how much. But it's not only on the supply side that things have changed rapidly. My favorite on the demand side, and which, which is something that we tend to forget, some of, uh, some of the things that I mentioned is that we have this underlying growth in energy demand. My favorite in this chart, the light blue line, the number of Chinese traveling internationally. It's grown from roughly 10 million in 2000 to almost 150 million last year. If that growth rate were to continue unabated to 2040, we would have 8 billion movements of Chinese in and out of the country. We don't think that's going to happen, but it's going to grow. And what do you do when you travel internationally from China? You have basically have two alternatives, right? You take the bus or the train to Mongolia, North Korea, or Vietnam, or you fly. Most people fly. 
the underlying growth for aircraft traffic in the emerging economies is huge. Look at the number of orders that some of the Asian airplanes put in place. And then you can add on the, the, the Emirates and the Etihads of, of the Middle East and so on. An aircraft demand equates to oil demand. And you can add on also the domestic Chinese air passengers, and you can add on the new Chinese cars. 15 to 20 million new cars put on the road in China every year. Somewhere between one-fourth and one-fifth of the global new car registrations in China alone. And they're all, for all practical purposes, unfortunately still running on oil. Hopefully that will change rapidly. So with all that uncertainty, several futures are possible. We made three. And we call them the thri triple R, three R's. It's not reserve replacement ratio, but it's reform, rivalry, and renewal. And the growth rates, the GDP growth rates are varying. This is one difference between our scenarios and IA scenarios. We think that the, ch the different ways of changing the energy mix will actually affect global GDP growth in different periods differently. IEA doesn't do that in their scenarios. They have the same growth rate for across the scenarios. They differ with respect to energy intensity or energy efficiency, if you like. So they consequently differ both in terms of level of GDP a little bit, but in particular by the level of energy demand we will have when you get to 2040. The reform case, the dark blue, that's the parallel of the new policy scenario IEA. It's a scenario where we have put in all the pledges that were promised as part of the Paris Agreement. And then we have assumed a further tightening of measures delivering on those targets after 2030 when the Paris Agreement goes out of date. So it's a Paris plus type of scenario. And I have to remind you that the Paris Agreement is a set of targets. We're still very far away from a lot of government governments putting in place measures, policy measures, that would actually move us in the direction of those targets. Hardly anything has happened in that arena. And you could speculate that the, the event last week would, uh, would delay that process by some years in a crucially important country. I'm just saying that. I don't, we don't know. But it's, we're still far away. But in that reform scenario, we assume that the targets will be met and they will be overshot, if you like, when you get towards 2040. Still, that scenario is very far away from delivering on climate targets. It's not enough. In that scenario, the energy use per unit of GDP goes from an index of 80 down to some 45, 50 in 2040. We become significantly more energy efficient, and it's, that's one of the absolutely critical assumptions that have to get right in order for us to have any chance of reaching climate targets. We have to become much more energy efficient globally. And that inclu that's including all the compensation effects that we have a tendency of doing. Every time we buy a new refrigerator, it's much more efficient than the old one. But then what do we do? We buy a slightly larger one. In Europe, we increasingly buy the American ones, which are much larger than ours. We have ice cube machines and cold water on the front door. And what do we do with the old one? Since every Norwegian, at least, above the age of 40, male, now brew our own beer, we take that refrigerator and put it down in the basement and use it as a beer cooler. So we keep both refrigerators. Well, that, the number out here, that includes those types of behavior. And, and that illustrates how challenging it is. Right? That's the reform scenario. And as a consequence, even if we're twice as rich in terms of GDP in 2040, driven partly by 2 billion new more people, but also by economic growth, we only use 20 to 25% more energy, the blue line here. So we're significantly much more efficient. Renewal, that's a two degree scenario. That's our parallel to the IEA 450 PPM scenario. It's a tremendously challenging development. That's not a, it's not a forecast, it's a backcasting scenario. What we've done there is we've said that Assume that energy-related CO2 emissions have to go down by 45%, which is what IPCC and IEA say, say it has to, in order for us to be on a trajectory that is consistent with the two-degree target. How can we get there? Well, we have to be much more energy efficient. So the, look at the light blue squares. 
we have to be twice as energy efficient as we are today, globally, so that we, by 2040, have double the income, but almost do not use more energy. Just imagine what it takes to get there, and I'll show you what that takes. But the energy efficiency part of that cannot be underestimated. It's really important. And in order for that to happen, consumer prices of energy have to go up, and we have to do a lot of digitalization, a lot of efficiency improvements, a lot of electrification, you, you name it. Then we have the third scenario, rivalry. That's realizing that it, it's not a given that every government of, in this world think that the climate challenge is the most important challenge to solve. There are other issues that are important. One of the issues is that we, you know, we gotta handle the fact that we don't like each other very well often, often. We're in conflict. We have examples of that today. We have sanctions with Russia caused by conflict. The impact of that is that GDP growth might be affected. Security or supply concerns go up in Europe because we don't trust the Russians to, serve, to, to, to supply us with gas. As a consequence, we use, probably use more coal in Europe than we otherwise would have. We cannot tr uh, trade in technology as efficiently as, as if, those, if those sanctions were not in place. Economic growth goes down. And also the ability to develop the new technological solutions that would deliver the type of energy efficiency and the type of greener energy mix will slow down. In that scenario, we have assumed uh, that uh, not a constant level, but a, but a high level of conflict in the Middle East. Middle East is not a good place to be in this scenario. Uh, the Chinese the relationships between China and its neighbors in Asia continue to be uh, not the best. In the description of this scenario, we wrote one sentence about the EU saying that in this scenario, the EU breaks up into smaller units with different degrees of inter economic integration. We published a report the 9th of June, and the 23rd of June, we had Brexit, which is an example of one of the things that could happen. And some people also say that the, the, result of the, the potential result of the election here last week could be a move in that direction with an increased conflict level and less focus on common solution of the climate challenge. In that scenario, then, energy efficiency does not develop as quickly, as, as good as possible, so we, uh, as good as in the other scenarios, so we have a 35% growth in energy demand. We're not quite as rich, but uh, almost. We have much more regional variation in economic growth rates in that scenario than, than in the other ones. Then there's one thing that is pretty important and where we are very sure. Not 100% sure, but very sure, and that's that our future climate problems and solutions will not be determined in Norway, globally. The things we do in Norway do not matter. The things we do in Brussels do hardly matter. But what, ma what matters is what happens in the part of the world where the economic growth is the highest and where half the global population lives. That map shows what the world would look like if the size of the countries were proportional to their population. The yellow is Russia. The green is not Russia, the green is China. That's India, that's Bangladesh, that's Pakistan. Less, less, less than 4,000 kilometers from Hong Kong, you find more than half the global population. That's where the economic development is high. That's where the energy use will increase most in this period, and then uh, in addition you can add on the Middle East, subsequently also Africa. That's where trade is growing. That's where the future middle class consumer is located. That's where a lot of the population growth is coming. And it's a region that is energy poor, with the exception of coal. So Asia, like Europe, in a sense, has too much coal and too little gas. If they use too much of that coal, like in the robbery scenario, we won't have a chance of reaching any type of global climate targets. This is about limiting coal demand growth in Asia and replacing that coal demand with renewable electricity, gas, and increased energy efficiency. And if we don't get it right there, we don't achieve our climate goals. In addition to energy efficiency, the question going forward is that are we able to speed up the change in the energy mix or are we not? And we need to. We have to. And this is where it's often undercommunicated, the challenge we have. It's if, when you listen to people that think we can go renewable tomorrow with solar and wind electricity driving most of our energy use, 
it sounds as if the energy system can change quickly. It cannot. Some of the people in the audience remember January 1974. At least two of us, I think. <laughs> that was just after OPEC won, 43 years ago. OPEC had contributed to a tripling, quadrupling of the oil price. Oil turned out to be extremely scarce, and we had car-free Sundays in Europe. I remember walking the streets in my hometown in Bergen, Norway, in a, on a, in a snowy January, and there were no car tracks on the road. It was really scary. Did we have enough oil? It's a long time ago, people. Then, 88% of global energy use was fossil. It's there. More oil, less gas, and slightly less coal as a share of the energy use than today, but 88% was fossil. 45 years later, we've been through a lot of revolutions. Collapse of the Soviet Union, Chinese economic miracle, IT revolution, the internet, the mobile phone, whatever, your iPads. 82% of the energy mix is still fossil. More gas, fortunately, but unfortunately also more coal, relatively speaking, and we use two and a half times as much energy. The fantastic revolution that I showed you in the, the growth in solar panels, solar capacity, the 100 doubling since the turn of the century, the result of that is half of that pink sliver at the top in terms of primary energy. The sum of solar and wind electricity is less than 2% of global primary energy demand. But fortunately, it grows really fast. And it has to. And we think it's possible. And in our scenarios, the energy mix changes much more rapidly in the next 25 years than over the last 45. And in particular, in the renewal scenario, the middle one here, a combination of technology development, rapid change in climate policies all over the world, will, and, and market prices and consumer behavior will drive that change. And if it ha one of the things that has to happen is that we have to get coal demand down by 50%. And this is what IEA said this morning as well. They're not as optimistic. They have slightly higher coal demand, but they're moving in our direction. We got to reduce coal demand by 50% in order to have any chance of reaching a climate target. And we will have a fantastic, much higher growth in re new renewable electricity, the pink one here, than in any other source of energy. Oil and gas demand are still almost half total primary energy demand in 2040 in a scenario where we reach the two degree target. Today it's 52%, or in 2013 it was 52%, it was the same in 2014 roughly, it goes down to some 45%. So in a world where we are on our way to reach the uh, two degree target in terms of global warming, oil and gas will still constitute almost half the global energy use, while coal demand is reduced by 50%. And you can play around with those figures, but that's roughly where you end up. And I'll challenge all of you to find a better way of getting there, and I'll come back to the details. This is what it looks like here in OECD <coughs> Americas. That includes uh, Chile, Mexico, Canada, and the United States. Look, the picture is the same historically, roughly. The picture looks the same, what, what it has to go to going forward. The main difference in terms of shares of energy in, in Americas relative to the rest of the world is that the nuclear energy part is slightly high, larger and the biomass is much lower. Otherwise, it's the same, and the change has to be the same. This is the result on CO2 emissions. Today, energy-related CO2 emissions, some 32, 33 billion tons. We know what it has to, or if we listen to the IPCC and look at what the average climate model all say together, it has to go down to 17, 18 billion tons by 2040. And in our renewal scenario, it does because it's a backcasting scenario. That's what we've put it and then we've solved for it. The Paris plus scenario reform, if we are able to do everything that every government has said they will do, plus tighten it, we're not even close. CO2 emissions are much too high. And the rivalry scenario is much worse in terms of CO2 emissions because it's, there's more coal and it's less energy efficient. In the IEA scenario, these are last year's IEA scenario. This year they come slightly more down on the new policy scenario, and now the 450 scenario is also very close to ours. And the biggest challenge of them all when the world has to reduce its energy-related CO2 emissions by 45%, it's probably not that the OECD countries have to re reduce it by 60, 
but it's that China's CO2 emissions have to go down by 60% too. China's CO2 emissions, the dark blue here, has quadrupled since 1990. And if we are to reach global climate targets, it has to go down to the level it had in 1998, 1999. Go down from 8 billion tons plus to some 3.5 billion tons. And why? Because we have to leave some room for Indian CO2 emissions to go up by 30% in this scenario, and some of the other emerging economies as well. And if China is able to do that, continue to grow by some 4, 4.5% 4 per year in terms of GDP, change the economy and reduce the CO2 emissions by 60% is probably the biggest performance of any economy any time. But that's what it takes. And that's one of the reasons why this two degree scenario is not very likely, to put it mildly. It's extremely challenging. What does it take? We've looked out the window and seen, tried to look for what are the changes in the energy, in addition to energy efficiency, in, in the possibility to transform the energy sector quickly enough to get there, what are the most likely candidates? One of them, technology shift for light duty vehicles, the battery electric car, the plug-in hybrids, the possibility of hydrogen in cars, in fuel cells. It's one of the things that could make this possible. You cannot see it in the statistics, this is the car fleets put on the road in 2013. If I showed you the 2015, it will look exactly the same. Note that you don't see any pink here. There is a little pink, and that's basically the electric vehicles in Norway and Amsterdam. But it could happen. Ten years from now, an electric car could be competitive with a combustion engine car in terms of cost performance without subsidies. It's not today, but it could become. And if it becomes that way, and you combine that with the fact that the car producers now see that in order for them to, to, to fulfill the fuel emission standards without cheating, they have to deliver electric vehicles. And Volkswagen this summer said that we will produce th 3 million electric vehicles by 2025, 30 different models, and the others are coming behind. Isn't, this is not driven by Elon Musk. This is not Tesla. This is decided by the large car producers. Once they do it, it might happen. And then for you, all of us, when we buy an, our next car, if an electric vehicle is co uh, competitive, why would we buy anything else? And that's what has to happen. And in the renewal scenario, it happens so much that by 2040, 90% of the new vehicles put on the road in terms of light duty vehicles are electric. This is more radical, if you like, than the Bloomberg New Energy Finance numbers. But it's one of the things that have to happen, otherwise we won't get there. Even in the reform case, we see quite a bit of electric vehicles, by the way. Starting from 2025, in 2025, in the renewal scenario, we have 30% market share. What we also have in that scenario is assumptions on urban planning and car sharing, whatever you like, that ensures that the number of new vehicles are smaller than what sort of the isolated increase in population and car density would indicate. So we don't sell more cars in 2040 than today with two billion more people, that's a radical assumption as well. And the consequence of this, 60% of the fleet running on electricity in this scenario in 2040, and it eats into oil demand from this part of the transportation sector. But light duty vehicles is only light duty vehicles. It's some hundred mopeds in, in Asia. It's the cars and it's the light trucks. And we're not, we're not moving in that direction, especially not here. You had three records this year in terms of car sales and car use. Record gasoline use in June, record mileage driven in July, 63% market share for the SUVs so far this year. One and a half million more SUVs put on the road in the United States now than two years back. So we're not moving in this direction, but it could happen, and it has to happen. This is, just remember that, this is, Everybody who talks about electric, electri well, not everybody, but a lot of people that talk about electrification of transport talks as if that's going to kill oil demand. It won't. It will limit growth in oil demand. This is tw today, the oil use in this sector is about 25 million barrels. It's about 25% of overall oil use. 
The rest is rest of transportation plus other uses, and I'll come back to that. So electrification of this one is the best potential we have, but it's not going to kill oil demand. Yeah, and then North Americas and, and, and the rest of the OECD Americas is going to look roughly the same. It has to look the same. And of course, this is, uh, this is one challenge. If, you, if, you're in, if I did this uh, presentation in Houston, people would question this change, both in terms of car sales and also the composition. But that's what has to happen. And if you don't believe this as a way to go, then I challenge you to come up with something else. And the second one, it's a really bad idea if we electrify the car fleet in China or Poland or West Virginia five years back if we don't do something with the electricity sector at the same time, right? Because there's so much coal in the electricity mix. 88% of the electricity in Poland is generated by coal. But that's the other part where we see the big potential. It's a decarbonization of the electricity sector. And that has to happen. If it doesn't, we can't get there. And look at what happens. This is the, the pink ones on top here. That's the result of, that's, the, few, that's the, the, the generation share, if you like, in electricity production from solar, electricity, and wind. The 2% of overall total primary energy demand is roughly 5% of global electricity today. You wouldn't believe that when you see all the windmills in California and the solar panels in Germany and, and the windmills in Denmark. But that's what it is. It's 5% of global electricity at the moment. That has to grow to some 45%. At the same time, we'll have to get more nuclear energy in globally, mainly in Asia. We still keep some gas, and we've got to get coal out of the mix. If we do that, if this is the result where we go from some 500, 600 gigawatts of capacity to 6,000 gigawatts of capacity in some, 3,000 each, solar and wind, we're on there. 3,000 gigawatts of windmills, that's 500,000 windmills of the largest offshore type we have today. If you place them out efficiently, they cover the area of Spain, if you put them together, 500,000 square kilometers. In that scenario, the copper used in those windmills equates 50% of the global copper market today. There's a lot of copper in electricity. There's, by the way, four times more copper in an electric vehicle than in a combustion engine car as well. So some of these markets for minerals are going to have exciting times if we're going to go this, in this direction. Uh, we don't really know whether we get it right, but we have to get it right. We have to have a lot of grids. We have to have a lot of capacity in terms of storage, in particular since a large part of the global population lives from 35 degrees north and upwards. It's not the intermittency during the 24-hour day that's the main challenge with with, uh, with solar and wind electricity, but it's the seasonal variation in generation capacity combined with the temperature. There are long periods of the winter when it's dark, cold, and windless, quiet, in the northern parts of the world. And we need a lot of batteries to make sure that we have enough electricity to get by Easter in Finland, Sweden, Norway, Russia, Canada, even here, because it's so dark during the winter. But we have to get it right. We have to get all the grids in place. We have to get all the, all the incentives right so that the utility sector that produces all this marginal zero cost of electricity can make money. Because that's one of the challenges with renewable electricity is that it's, the electricity price is very low when you produce. Because when you produce, it doesn't cost anything to produce. So how do we get the money, the incentives right? But we have to figure that out. And we haven't yet. And we have 25 years to do it. It looks the same here, even more, look at this. We assume that in Chile, Mexico, Canada, and, and the United States, close to 60% of all the electricity generated has to come from sun or wind. Not very likely, but necessary. Even in the reform scenario, we have a lot of new renewable electricity. That is more likely, but in, this is in a scenario where we do not reach climate targets. The reason one of the reasons why we think these are the two of the key options, in addition to en energy efficiency, is that, and it's not easy, not at all, but they are easier options than the, the other alternatives, we think. And one reason for that is that we think the rest of the transportation sector is more difficult to change. We will have much more fuel-efficient airplanes in 2040, but we're going to have a lot more airplane traffic when these 8 billion Chinese moving in and out, right? 
And we cannot electrify an airplane by 2040, we think, if you want to carry luggage, passengers, and batteries at the same time. That's not going to happen. When we have 2 billion new uh, middle-class consumers in Asia, we're going to have a lot more trucking. Trucking traffic is the underlying demand for that goes up. Even if the trucks become more efficient and we're going to have more gas, we're going to electrify all railroads. That's not the case today. And we're going to have more gas into shipping and trucking as well. But still, we don't think we can eliminate all demand or reduce it significantly. Look here. Even in, with all that efficiency improvements we have, we still have roughly constant oil demand in this part of the transportation sector, which is probably a fantastic achievement given the, given the growth of the underlying demand. This is 25 million barrels. It's almost as large as light duty vehicles. The rest of oil demand is here, together with gas and electricity and so on. And in this, we will have significant changes here too, but one of the key factors that is growing the demand for oil and gas is the two billion new middle class consumers. We have a lot of de increased demand for manufactured products. Feedstock, which comes from oil and gas. All the seats that you're sitting in, made of oil and gas. Fantastic amount of square meters of wall-to-wall -wall carpets around the world, all made of oil and gas, and that's growing. And the feedstock there is pretty efficiently used already. Hopefully, we can get the energy used to transform the oil and gas can become much less carbon intensive. But the underlying demand for oil and gas as feedstock, which we do not burn, by the way, so it doesn't emit CO2 by itself, is one of the reasons why oil and, demand, the oil and gas demand continues to grow in all these scenarios. And then the conclusion is that this is what oil and gas demand changes are across sectors. I've been through it. The main reason why oil demand goes down in the renewal scenario from today is, is this purple part, which is the overall transportation demand. So in, in this scenario, oil demand from 2013 to 2040 in total goes down by 14 million barrels. It would go down much more if it hadn't been for the increased demand for manufactured polymer plastic products. A Tesla is mainly made of plastic. If you have a carbon hub around a car, it's made of carbon, coal. So we need coal. There's 100 times more steel in a windmill per watt than there is a, in a gas-fired power plant. Steel is iron and coal. We need coal and, and, and oil and gas as feedstock, some of it. It's one of the reasons why, the, sorry, why this continues to increase across the scenarios. For gas demand, the key to whether we will have constant or higher gas demand going forward is the development in the power sector. In a renewal scenario, in a two degree scenario where we get this fantastic growth in renewable electricity, gas demand in that sector goes down. But gas demand in, for feedstock still continues to increase. That's the yellow one here is gas. This is one of the reasons why we can't get out of oil and gas even in a two degree scenario. And then the result, Conclusion is that we need not only investments in a fantastically growing renewable electricity sector, but we still need investments in oil and gas as well. Because going back to where I started, the problem, if you like, with oil and gas is that if we don't invest, production falls. And it falls much more rapidly than any demand figure. So we have to replace a lot of oil and gas just to keep track with demand, even in a two degree scenario. And how much? If you look at this, this is, oil, this is the oil demand last year, 95, 96 million barrels per day. If we stopped investing today and let normal decline rates decide production, production would fall with some 3 to 6% per year. Somewhere, the result in 2040, if we didn't do anything, would be in this range, in this gray blue shaded area here. But the demand for oil in a two degree scenario is close to 80 million barrels. It's the top of the light blue. And if you, th if you think the other scenarios are more likely, it's higher. Reform is about 103 and rivalry is about 115. But in the renewals case, it's 80. And if we didn't invest, we can produce somewhere between 30 and 60. No, 20 and 50, sorry, 20 and 50. So we have to replace between 30 and 60 million barrels per day of new production within the next 25 years even in a scenario that where we go towards the two-degree target. 
That's three to six times the current production of Saudi Arabia. It's a huge challenge. And then for gas, challenge is the same. And in addition, we have to produce 17 times more energy electricity from renewable electricity sources, solar and wind. So we have to do all three. And the amount of new energy delivered by the new oil and gas in the two degree scenario is more than twice the new energy delivered by renewable electricity. So this is why companies like Statoil, Total, and all the others are talking about both growing and growing more rapidly in percentage terms in renewable electricity, but at the same time continuing to invest in oil and gas. We have to do all three, it's not either or. Even if we wanna go, and we all wanna go, in the two degree scenario direction. Unfortunately, we're not on, we're not in, on, on that way any, any, at the moment, but we hope to get there pretty soon. Paris was an important step forward. Not very much has happened on the, tar, on the measure side after Paris, and we've had a couple of setbacks as well. So where we are ending up, we don't know, but um, no matter which scenario that turns out to be most right, or least wrong, all of this will be wrong, uh, there's a significant need for new investments in new energy, both oil, gas, and renewable electricity. And this is just to summarize that there's a lot of forecasts out there. I'm not gonna go through the details, but we can, if you look at the gas demand that we have, the light blue line here in the renewable, the renewable case, we cannot be accused of being very optimistic on behalf of gas compared to other forecasters, even though we produce a lot of oil and gas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for this really uh, masterful uh, tour d'horizon of the um, strategic uh, findings of your, your report. Um, I'd really, I, I really think it shows um, the, the very substantial contribution that uh, Stato has been making to the energy policy debate. Uh, there's clearly parallels one can find between your three scenarios, uh, reform, renewal, rivalry, and the three scenarios of the IEA. Uh, base case, uh, new policies, and, and the 450 scenario. At the same time, um, having been at the IEA, uh, I was responsible for short-term and, and medium-term forecasting, not the long-term Rio forecasting, but I, I can testify that uh, Stato has contributed dramatic, uh, very significant inputs into the Rio process. And the, uh, as you said, uh, today's Rio uh, is coming a little bit closer to the findings of your report. And I think that's an illustration of the leadership that you have provided uh, in the interaction that you've had with the IEA. And I'm very uh, appreciative that uh, you continue to provide these kind of insights and, and leadership in our discussions with Colombia as well. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I will not monopolize uh, the question time. I will make a very conscious effort. I have many questions, but I will limit myself and make a very conscious effort to open up the uh, debate and the questions to uh, the audience, both here and also online uh, through our um, Twitter account, uh, Columbia U Energy. Um, uh, and you can ask questions this way. Um, one point, uh, I don't want to draw you into any uh, uncomfortable uh, area. But I, I do want to uh, pick your brain a little bit because you uh, provide deep thinking about uh, key issues. So you mentioned that your report came out just one week before Brexit. Uh, and then uh, last week uh, we had some, some news here uh, in Washington. But at the same time, and you, you said that this is the kind of stuff that's unpredictable and it's too early to draw conclusions on what these changes mean. Uh, but at the same time, you said that what happens in Europe uh, is irrelevant because the world is really, uh, changes are really taking place in Asia. Uh, everything is happening in Asia. You showed the map of the world, uh, weighted for population, and Asia is oversized. So the question is, and you said what we do in Europe, in Oslo, in Brussels, doesn't really matter. So do the changes in, in, with Brexit and in Washington, do they really matter? Uh, does U.S. leadership really make a big difference, or uh, do the states play as much of a role as, the, as Washington here in the U.S.? Does uh, China play as much of a role in global leadership as, as Washington? 
does the market, has the train left the station, and is renewable such a big business, such a profitable business today, uh, that uh, the market matters more than policymakers? So what's the role of policy and what's the role of the U.S., particularly in the policymaking arena? Yeah, I, th I think uh, um, I probably expressed myself a little bit unclear by saying that it doesn't matter what we do in, in uh, Europe or the United States. I, I think, uh, um, to be precise, I think there's definitely still a need for leadership in terms of policies. Um, in terms of uh, the willingness to contribute to solve the common problem. Um, I won't exclude also that, um, that the pos possibly the most important contribution that uh, the rich countries uh, uh, in Western Europe and, and uh, North America can do to our common uh, problem is to contribute to financing the necessary changes in, in the emerging economies. Where what doesn't matter is uh, is the actual emission reductions that we do locally, especially especially in in Europe, I would say that because we're too small in a sense. So it's um, but but uh, but in order to make make uh, the changes the necessary changes uh, uh, elsewhere in the areas where energy demand is growing and where there is too much coal locally and too little ability to pay for imports of gas too little money to pay for the technological development that is taking place in renewable electricity, our leadership in, in ensuring that that could happen uh, is still important. Um, technology transfers. It's a big paradox that uh, when, you, when you're on the streets in Beijing or Shanghai, there's a lot of German cars there. Uh, you would think that they were the tallest people on earth as well because they ha all have the extended versions. But, but what is the, the big paradox is that all those cars do not have a start-stop function. So when they're stuck in traffic, they emit CO2. That doesn't happen anymore in Europe. When you're stuck in traffic, your engine shuts down. But it's the technology that is, they, they can't afford or they don't want to import that or we don't allow it. And, and so it's also about ensuring the most modern technology is being used and that we even have to pay for it. Uh, the, most of the smartest brains in the world are in Asia, but, uh, but uh, still most of the money are in the West, so we might have to pay them for developing their own technologies. So that's the leadership part. On the renewable side, um, well, first of all, um, there is still a need for subsidies in terms of renewables. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but it's fortunately going in the right, the right direction in terms of lowering costs. Um, where we haven't seen the end result yet is the total system cost of a system that is to a very large extent depending on renewable electricity. What we see now is marginal investments where it's fantastically competitive. Um, we, had a, we had big news about this uh, uh, record low solar panel auction price in Chile some about a month or two back, uh, which is very good. But, uh, but, if, but if you look closely at it, it was an auction where the Chilean government not only bought the solar panel at record low prices, uh, but they also bought coal-fired electricity as backup in the same auction at twice the cost, because they need electricity all, all day. And the solar panels are su supposed to be located in probably the best location in the world, which is in the Atacama Desert. The only problem with that is that there's nobody there. So the Chilean government also pays for the grid investments to, ne to pr transport the electricity down. So the system costs of, of a larger system is something that we have to handle. Um, so we need policies in addition to the market. Uh, we need a CO2 price. It's the biggest deficit in global climate policies is that there it's, it's, it's so crazily difficult to get a price on carbon. Uh, one of the big paradoxes in Europe is that the, as, as we continue to subsidize renewable electricity, uh, at the same time the coal price went down. We have a lot of uh, coal-dependent jobs, uh, as a, for instance, in eastern Germany. And, and the consequence of that is that gas has been pushed out of the electricity mix as renewables came in, and we have coal as backup, very cheap coal coming in, and the CO2 emissions in Europe are basically stable. Here, the market has worked to get your CO2 emissions down because we've phased coal out of the, out of the electricity mix uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the advent of, of cheap gas and combined with, with emission standards. So, so we need policies. We need policies to make sure that people can make money in producing renewable electricity in the future. 
we need policies to make sure that somebody is willing to invest in backup capacity in gas-fired power plants in order to, which will only produce 20% of the time, but which is critically important when it produces. So we need framework conditions to make that happen. So we need both policies and markets. Anyone wants to ask a, a question? There's a microphone standing in the, in the middle of the room. So I would like to ask that you, uh, if you have a question, that you stand up to the microphone and uh, introduce yourself and ask the, the question. Uh, and online, uh, our hashtag, uh, this hashtag is CGP events. And the Twitter handle is at Columbia U Energy. One of the um, takeaways I got from, uh, from your report, there's many of them uh, in the perspectives. And the, perspective, the, the book came out in June, but there's still learnings that get out from it. Uh, one of the particularly insightful uh, aspects I thought was this uh, um, innovation that you brought in terms of forecasting not only, um, not only using GDP as an input into energy forecasting, but using the energy mix as an input into GDP forecasting, which I think is very uh, unique and very insightful. Uh, we tend to, to uh, use uh, GDP assumptions as, a, as, a, as an input into our modeling of uh, energy growth, but that GDP forecast itself uh, embeds some energy assumptions that tend to be un, un, unquestioned. So there's often a circularity in, in forecasting, which is, uh, one of, I think, one of the major problems that we face when we try to think about the energy future. And your report, I think, uh, tries to get uh, around this issue and to, to, to um, dig into this more with more depth than most, most uh, other reports do. Uh, your focus it seems to me is more demand driven when you look at the energy mix and you said, you know, we used to think about peak oil and now it's more peak demand. Uh, but much of your analysis really revolves around users, around demand drivers. How much have you uh, been able to look at the, the resource availability, particularly on oil? Uh, do you have some kind of view of the oil production outlook irrespective of, of demand or is it entirely demand driven in your view? Uh, no, I mean, on a regular basis and as part of the, the, the work underlying this report, we, we do uh, supply estimates and, and judgments and, and uh, country by country, uh, in particular on oil, but also on gas. Um, and uh, I guess our view is that, uh, that uh, the resources are there. Uh, it's a bit about, it's a bit of... Uh, Sort of, it's a cost issue which resources will be developed first. Um, increasingly, you could be worried that that uh, we depend on resources that are not easily producible. I mean, when you look at the exploration results over the last years, there is an increasing worry that 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 uh, oil supply will be more um, scarce than than what we have thought over the last three four years. And then what you end up relying on then is is oil qualities that are not perfectly geared to a situation where we need less diesel and more gasoline, relatively speaking. Uh, we end up with resources that are not easily producible. There, there's a lot of oil resources in Venezuela, for instance, but, but, uh, but uh, it seems very unlikely that the, the speed of extraction can, can come significantly up. And then you're stuck with resources that can pr be produced for 225 years, but we should produce them for 40. Uh, so also the quality issue is is one aspect and the and the speed of, of production. So so we're we, we have to work work more on that I think um, and in particular on, it, it's it's that's more a, a problem for oil than for gas. Gas is uh, is uh, available in larger co quantities and and you don't have the quality issues in the same same manner. Um, one potential resource issue that we that I think we should start looking into which we haven't, uh, but that's the resource uh, use associated with 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 the type of rapid electrification that we're uh, that we're going into here i mentioned the the, the i mean co the, the demand for copper uh, the demand for cobalt if we're going to use lithium ion batteries um, if we're not going to use lithium ion batteries which we probably cannot if every household is going to have the equivalent of a couple of tons of batteries then what's the what's the mineral that's going to be the basis for batteries. What's the energy density you can expect? Uh, what's the likely development? And all, all those types of resource market issues. Uh, uh, my colleague in BHP Billiton 
some weeks back had an article in the Financial Times saying that, uh, that, uh, that electrification of the transportation sector would have a bigger positive impact on the demand for some key mit minerals and metals than the negative demand impact for oil. And, and uh, where are those resources and, and, and what's the resource implications of that? And it's, uh, it's, um, we have in the rivalry scenario that we have, we, we model that also by assuming in that scenario that you could have towards the end of the period here increasing resource conflicts uh, across other resources like water. So, it's, uh, so that whole resource nexus is, uh, is uh, something that, for instance, MIT addressed that in their regular reports where they both forecast food production and, and water scarcity together with energy. We, we don't have the capacity to do that, but there are some issues there. That We're looking at that as well here. Yeah, and I, I guess you do that too, but uh, yeah, I just read their <laughs> recent report, MIT. So, and that's good that you do that. And, and any kind of insight there is very welcome. It's, um, I talked to a friend of mine who works in the BASF, and he said that there's not enough lithium out there if everybody goes, is going to have a, a battery. We're going to have a big hole in Chile, and then we're out of it. So, uh, but uh, he might be right, I don't know, but we'll see. There's a lot of discussion these days about peak demand. So um, recently, uh, the C CFO of Shell uh, came out with a forecast that oil uh, demand would peak uh, within five to 15 years. Um, today, the IEA said, uh, no way, uh, oil demand will continue to grow uh, in the foreseeable future. You seem to have a more nuanced view. So you're saying renewables is going to be a, a major part of the, of the picture. Efficiency is going to be part of the mix. But oil and gas will remain about 50% of the mix. So you're, how does it translate into a peak or not peak? Uh, are you a peak, peak, demand, uh, peak demander? Or, uh, We're a peak demander. Yeah. Now, we've had, uh, in our central case, the reform case, uh, uh, we've had peak oil demand around 2030 for the last uh, three, four years, five years. Uh, this year's edition, we have peak demand, peak oil demand in, in the reform case in 2029. Um, and one of the reasons we get that is that we have a, we have a higher penetration of electricity in the light duty vehicles sector, um, uh, slightly more energy efficiency assume, assumptions on, on the car fleet, and then probably also slightly lower uh, car density figures in, in the emerging economies. And uh, if you get that wrong, I mean, if you, if you get, get it wrong, the, 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 dry, the, the, my, the average mileage and the number of cars per 1,000 people in China and India, you could miss oil demand by 5 million barrels because it's so huge, right? But, but that's the, so, so because that, that's the question. It's sort of when the efficiency improvement and uh, electrification of the fleets in the emerging, in the mature economies, when that, that catch up with the growth in car density in countries like India and China and the growth in the car fleet. So, and, and as a consequence of that, we've had peak oil demand at slightly different levels, but, uh, but around 2029, 20, 2030 over the last years. And of course, in the, if we're going to go in the two degree direction, we have to see peak oil demand re very rapidly. But that would still require tremendous investments and yeah, and and basement of declines and replay and fantastic challenges in terms of, of uh, carbon pricing. I mean, in in this uh, renewal scenario, we have a global carbon price uh, close to one hundred and fifty dollars per ton by by twenty forty. So, because you have to limit demand one way. I mean, it, the producer price is going to be lower than than in the other scenarios, but the consum consumer price has to be high. Otherwise, you don't get the, the supply and demand to balance. So, uh, and that's either a tax or a price or whatever on carbon. Thanks. Thanks very much for a great presentation. I'm uh, Tim Borsman with Columbia here. Um, I've got two questions. One, uh, at the end of your presentation, you outlined very clearly that you know you anticipate substantial demand growth and a, and a lack of lack of investment. I guess today, um, I wonder if you can outline what factors as a company weigh and why those investments are not necessarily made timely, um, because it seems like a pretty safe bet. Uh, and then the other question I'd have is what technologies you're watching today uh, that are emerging or maybe not, maybe not even emerging that you would think that could you know, dramatically influence your scenarios, outcomes uh, going forward? Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess the, the, the challenge with that chart is, is, uh, is that there is an, uh, in order to satisfy demand in all these scenarios, we need to invest a lot in new oil and gas. Um, and in other types of, not to mention the grids. And IEA has, is, the, is the one institution that, that gives those figures, and, it, and they're tremendously mind-boggling mind -boggling numbers. 
Uh, and then the question today is, are, is the current financial situation in the oil and gas and the energy companies as a whole such that you could expect these investments to actually take place? Is, there's a risk of too low investments here. Um, the interest rates are low, but the perceived risk premiums and the price expectations over the next couple of years and the current financial situation in all chains, in all parts of the energy value chain is such that you could be afraid that there's not, in, there's not enough investments, even in the two degree scenario. And the consequence of that, of course, is that you're going to have scarcity of oil and gas and other types of energy, and, and, and we're going to have higher prices at some point. And, to, and, the, and, you might, and the investments might, in, in a sense, might not come in time. And what the consequence of that is, of course, you have the, the, the eternal cycle, cyclical movement of oil and gas prices and energy prices, which also Fatih Birol talked about today, as far as I, I, I got out of the London presentation. So, so that is, but there is definitely a, a risk of, of, um, of, of too low investments. And it helps sometimes to put things into perspective. One of the things that, that we need to do is, is um, I mean, over the, I don't know, how, when did Thomas Edison invent the light bulb? 130 years ago? So we've used 130 years to give electricity to 5.7 billion people. And in order for the renewal case here to, 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 to be delivered on, we have to give electricity to 3.8 billion new people within the next 25 years especially if we, we aim to have uh, all the other sustainable development targets in place. 1.3 billion that do not have ex electricity today and 2.5 billion new people. So, it's, so some of these things, are, it's, it's a tremendous uh, challenge. And the, pic the picture that we had on the front page of, of one of the cities in the emerging economies, which I think you might see here as well, yeah, the up, upper right there, you see the electricity grid that, that we have in big cities in the world, right? And, and uh, so, so the grid investments, the modernizing of the energy system, all those types of things. In addition, we have, in a renewal case, we have to produce twice as much nuclear electricity in 2040 to get this mix to, to be fixed. And, and uh, nuclear electricity is fantastically expensive. Black swans, in terms of technology, or what are the things that we're not looking at or, or that we don't see? If we saw them, they would be white, uh, the swans. But, um, but um, what is... Uh, there's a lot of us that are discussing the impact now, and, and, and of, of course, being technology freaks, uh, some of us, we, we, you know, we like the idea of a self-driving driving car, uh, the car sharing type of behavior, which is not technology, but it's behavior. Um, a lot of that is, well, first of all, the self-driving car could actually increase the demand for transport. It's, it's a myth that it necessarily reduces the demand for transport. It reduces the demand for asphalt or tarmac, because you can put the cars closer together. But, but, uh, but if everybody can drive their own car, or if everybody has a car that can drive themselves, uh, the two-year-old could drive herself to the kindergarten, right, and instead of the mother driving, and you get more transport. Um, I, we had an example in a Norwegian newspaper, a guy who said that when I get my self-driving car, I'm going to fly up to my meeting in Trondheim, which is 600 kilometers away from Oslo, and then I'm going to send my car the night before so that I, when I step out of the plane, I have my own car there. That's a lot of transport. Uh, instead of renting the car. It's much cheaper to drive it, in particular if it's electric. You don't pay any toll roads or anything. Uh, no, so, so, and also embedded, you have to remember that in, embedded in a lot of these technologies, the demand management, smart grids, whatever, is, taking, uh, taking the heat off the water heaters during the night when we don't use it and putting the, electric, the equivalent electricity on the grid, all that stuff is embedded in the, uh, or part of that, it has to be embedded in an assumption where we become twice as energy efficient, right? So a lot of the digitalization, all that stuff is part of that is becoming, I mean, being able to deliver twice the GDP growth and hardly using more energy is contained implicitly in those assumptions. And, and we don't have the detailed models to say how much of it it is. I think the, the, uh, the, the, the eternal black swan in, on the supply side or on the, electric, or in the energy side is, is uh, cold fusion. And it's always been 40 years ahead of us. It was when I was 10 years old, and it still is 40 years ahead of us in large scale. But if it happens, it changes everything here. Um, I think one of the, maybe one of the key uncertainties that, that is more difficult to model, but which also could have a large impact is if the, con but that's not a technology issue. It's a behavioral consumption issue. It's if the consumption patterns or the habits of the next generation middle class consumers, which are basically going to be in Asia, if that is significantly different than, than, than what we see today. 
uh, if we don't drive to work, or if they don't drive to work, if they stay at home and work, then you're going to have a little much less transport. If they don't consume polymer constructed products, if they don't sit on these type of chairs. And so that's a big uncertainty, and that's difficult to model. We don't see that type of changes in behavior yet, with the exception of, of the millennials being slightly less prone to have a, a driver's licenses than we do, but uh, they still fly to warm areas of the world during the summer. Okay. Question? Thanks very much for your very insightful presentation. Yeah, I have only one question. You know, uh, what uh, can you just introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, yeah. Albert Binashvili, you know, political science professor here at Columbia, and uh, my question is, uh, what are the main factors that made you uh, take a stance that appears to be well uh, quite skeptical towards the prospects of the use of natural gas, even in the short and mid-term perspective? Yeah, you, you mean the, the demand forecast for natural gas? Demand. Uh, well, for the, for the short and medium term, I mean, it, it, there are areas of the world where, they, where, they, where gas demand growth is high, but, uh, but there are other areas where it's low, in particular in Europe. So, so in total, the global gas demand over the next years uh, is not very significant. Part of that is driven by, the, by this, to some, to, to some extent, unintended consequences of energy and climate policies, in particular in Europe. Gas demand in Europe would be higher if we had a, uh, a different combination of policies. But going forward, we think uh, the, uh, the, gas de the underlying gas demand growth is going to be significant. Um, in a reform case, uh, we have demand growth in Asia being equivalent to a new Europe. And one of the reasons is that it's one way of, of getting out of the uh, getting out of coal and at the same time satisfying demand for electricity. But in you know? the short term, within the short term, it's still you know quite modest. Yeah, your vision. Yes. Yeah, in, in the short term, it's 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 modest. Part of part of it is that uh, that it's uh, per, in in the in the regions of the world where energy demand grow uh, rapidly at the moment. Gas is relatively expensive because you have to imp they have to import it. The alternative is domestic coal, mm -hmm. particularly in, the, in terms of electricity generation. So it, it's so so the, so the value proposition, if you like, for for a politician uh, in in Southeast and East Asia uh, to start importing relatively expensive gas uh, to replace coal is is not perfect. So that's also one of the reasons why the, why this demand development is slower than what it otherwise could have been. Okay, thank you. Hi, Eric. Uh, I'm Tatiana Mitrova with the Center on Hello. Global Energy Policy <laughs> and with the Russian Academy of Sciences. May I ask three questions? <laughs> I understand that probably that's too much, but I mean, the first one is about the uh, costs of renewables. So what is the assumption of the cost reduction which would allow, for example, to reach this two degree uh, target uh, scenario? Uh, do you see realistically such a tremendous uh, cost reduction happening, or is it just more like a wishful thinking? What should happen in order for us to survive without severe climate change? Um, the second uh, question is on electricity storage. So do you see it happening, becoming really commercially viable, and what is the time frame? Is it introduced into your scenarios and when you think it could become uh, commercially uh, viable already? Yeah, and the third question, it's actually more, uh, more about regional issue, it's about Africa. So the population growth is amazing, it's like one more billion people living there mm. by 2040. Uh, what do you think could be a solution uh, for energy poverty uh, there? So what's the fuel mix in this region? Because otherwise uh, we will have migration problems in Europe, <laughs> really very strong. Thank you. Thanks. Difficult questions, but then I shouldn't expect anything less from you. Um, on the cost reductions for renewables, I mean, I mean, our modeling apparatus is is not sufficiently detailed to have all the cost developments on each kind of technology into the model and how that ex goes to 2040. Um, so it's basically an assumption there that that um, in order to to be able to to deliver that much electricity from renewable sources, new renewable sources. 
uh, we will see a development driven by a combination of continued technological development, as we see now, so it's sort of creeping down on the cost curve, at, which at some point becomes flat. Mm -hmm. um, a policy that drives that development, which has to do with carbon pricing, uh, uh, it has to do with continued subsidies in, in large parts of this for a while. Um, and and uh, and also also um, um, direct regulation, uh, but uh, but it's so it's more an assumption that it has to take place uh, if it and and it can take place because uh, in all these scenarios uh, we believe that the, the current level of oil and gas prices, uh, as an example, are too low to be sustainable. So in all these scenarios, the average price going forward is going to be higher than what we have today, and then there's room for continue development of, of renewables with under, underneath that and still be competitive. Uh, on electricity storage, it's, it's, it's a bit about the same. It's, it's um, difficult to see it now that it's developing. Uh, the energy density of batteries are still extremely low compared to what is necessary, uh, especially when you think of seasonal storage. Uh, so, so that will, but we'll see electri uh, indirect electricity storage used. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of water, hydro, pumped hydro probably. It's going to be gas. Mm -hmm. It has to be gas. And, and, and then we have to have incentives in terms of having, keeping gas-fired power plants as backup. It's going to be continued development of battery technologies, but, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a thermodynamic limit as to how, how efficient uh, batteries can become. Um, and, and uh, it's, it's going to gradually develop where we have uh, m most growth in renewable electricity sources and intermittent and seasonally varying sources. And so that's where it's going to happen. And it's again driven by, it has to be driven by, by policies in terms of, in, in terms of tariff regulations, uh, uh, feed-in tariff, type, well, it's not feed-in tariff, but the capacity payments, capacity subsidies and so on. Um, and hopefully we're going to have enough minerals to to store all that electricity if it's going to be batteries, right? But it's, it's probably not only going to be batteries. Africa, um, yeah, you're right. It's going to be twice as large in terms of people by 2040. It's uh, half the global population growth in, in 2040 years in Africa. Um, we don't give it the attention it deserves as a region in these types of forecasts. And the main reason is that the, the, the current energy use is so low that even if it grows fantastically it's and, and much more than in other regions, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't decide our common future. If we, if we talk about 2070, then it, it becomes larger. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a bit too early to see Africa. And, uh, but, uh, but what we will see there is probably, that's probably the region where you'll see uh, increased um, use of decentralized electricity, solar panels, jumping across. Um, but they also need backup. They, need, they also need electricity uh, in, at night. Uh, Africa today is characterized by, uh, by all the places that have electricity. They, they become black when they need it, when the sun sets. And then uh, the diesel generator starts up in the, in the rich parts of the big cities. Right? So, so, so Africa also needs uh, the backup systems. Um, more hydroelectricity probably in Africa as well. But, um, and they have to get out, like, like India, in order to have a sustainable development, they have to get out of polluting biomass as a source of heating and cooking. And that's our common challenge, is to ensure that, or to contribute to that happening. So. Thank you. I think we have to bring it to a close, um, unless we, you have time for one tiny second. It's seven, to, you have a, a plane have to catch, a, right? I have a car, a car to pick me up in 10 minutes, so I can one more question. One more question, yeah. okay. Thank you for that. One more question. <laughs> so, uh, using Statoil as an example of an uh, oil and gas Can company. you just introduce yourself in, in one second? Yeah. yeah. Jorge Salem. I'm from SIPA, uh, studying the MDP program. So, using Statoil as an oil and gas company uh, example, so in, I just want to ask this bundle question. So, inflicting change in a major corporation is usually a complex a complex process, so especially if you have to respond to the shareholders, right, that they are seeking profit. So if you could equate and compare how the profits generated and like how much more profitable it is to produce and sell oil and gas versus renewables, 
Then um, currently, what's the percentage of coming investments of, of Star Oil in renewable energy? And how can oil and gas companies motivate themselves to innovate in renewable and invest in renewables and invest more on them while satisfying this increasing demand and the profit seeking nature of the investors? Another challenging question. Um, well, for, well, first of all, to, at the moment, in the oil and gas companies, the profitability of oil and gas investments made in a period of high costs is not huge. Right? Uh, and the profitability of renewable investments could, be, could, could actually be competitive at the moment because, to some extent, you have a guaranteed electricity price. That's the that's the way these renewable investments work at the moment, right? You 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 you, you we compete in auctions in terms of a guaranteed electricity price, and you can have a rate of return that is that is uh, that is competitive with some of the recent oil and gas investments that we make. I mean, that's one of the problems in the industry that we had a we had a fantastically high cost level, and then the price crashed. So, but historically and over time, you would expect. Uh, rates of return in an oil and gas industry to be slightly higher than in, 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 in renewable electricity because it's, a, because it's a higher risk industry. But on a risk adjusted basis, it doesn't necessarily have to be higher, but it has to be competitive. And that's the, I mean, that's the future challenge for all energy producers at the moment is where, do, where is the profitability going to be when both in terms of producing oil and gas, but also in, and coal for that matter, for those that still continue and have to continue to do that. Um, but also renewable electricity. What, where is the revenue going to come from in an electricity sector characterized by zero marginal cost production? And that's a big unanswered question. And, and part of that, the answer is regulation. Part of it is, is, uh, is that the markets have to work. Um, we think going forward that, it, that it, uh, increasingly it will be a competitive advantage to be a company which has a lower carbon footprint, a lower carbon efficiency, lower, uh, higher carbon efficiency, lower carbon emissions in the production than the other producers or than the average. And at the moment, our carbon emissions in our production are much lower than the global average. Uh, increasingly, we will build up a portfolio of, of renewable energy sources. We have started out with offshore wind. Uh, we're a sizable producer of offshore wind, in, in particular in the UK, uh, because we think we have a competitive advantage in that type of electricity generation. It's offshore, we know how to handle equipment and all that stuff, and it's, uh, and it's into a market that we know. And, and the framework conditions in the UK for that type of, of, uh, of electricity generation is good. Uh, going forward, you could expect that the, the rate of growth in our investments in renewable sources of energy will be much higher than in oil and gas. But the size of the portfolio is such that our, the absolute level of our investments will continue to be much larger in oil and gas than in renewable energy for a, for a relatively long period. Just to, just to replace, I mean, if this were a company, just to replace the existing production with new production is a tremendous challenge, even when you want to be part of a growth, growth business in electricity generation. So, but it's, it's, uh, it's a bit about, uh, it's also about finding the right projects. We, we just invested in a large, show, or we will in, continue to build in, we have gone into a large offshore wind park in, in Germany. And uh, some of our competitors are going heavily into sol solar energy. Uh, shouldn't exclude that we will take part in that as well. But you have to find the right projects, the right partners. Uh, we have to provide some. We have to come to the market with with a specific competence to be competitive. And and so far we're really good at offshore oil and gas and offshore wind. And uh, and then we'll see. Great. This has been a <coughs> really wide-ranging and very insightful discussion. I think we covered a lot of ground. There's mo a lot more we could cover, and we could keep going for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, time is limited. You have a plane to catch. So uh, this is really a very interesting, challenging, but, but fascinating time in the energy world where so many um, conflicting, sometimes challenges are at hand, sustaining economic growth, dealing with climate change, uh, providing uh, access to energy to those who don't have it, and so on. And there's changes in technology, in geopolitics, in, in many areas of the world. Um, and I think your insights and uh, the um, thinking that your report has articulated, but also the insights you provided tonight, really help get around some of those issues. 
So thank you very much. Uh, let me join me, please, in giving uh, Eric a hand. Thank you. Thanks.